having started skiing at an early age when I was much more sighted, I learned to love it. And it gave me a certain feel that as I lost my eyesight, just couldn't be replaced. Skiing for me gave me an opportunity to move with freedom. It was about three, four years ago that my family and I, we went out to Montana. We had an incredible ski experience. But at the end of that trip, I just have come to the conclusion that it's probably just too dangerous to be doing. I said to my family, this is it. I said, I can't do this anymore. Fast forward three years later, I had the amazing opportunity to meet Eric. And he tells me that he climbs mountains. He goes down Grand Canyon Rapids in a kayak. I mean, just what seems to be absolutely absurd and crazy stuff, and he does it with zero vision. When you go blind, you're worried that you're not gonna be able to do anything of importance. As a blind person, I wanna sort of teach this message of no barriers, what it means to kind of live that no barriers life, to develop the kind of mindset that helps you flourish when you're looking forward into uncertainty, into these big challenges that are overwhelming. It was really a psychological challenge to regain the slopes. I didn't know how it would work. I didn't know how working with a guide would be. I didn't know what the conditions would be. Stand up. Good, forward. Now to your right. Okay, Daly, you ready? Okay. Here we go. And suddenly, it just became all okay. Not just okay, it became exhilarating. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I'm skiing for the first time with Eric and Dale. I'm going as fast as I can go, and I mean, I'm keeping up with him, which is amazing. And every now and then, I close my eyes for like two seconds, and I get worried about hitting a mogul or catching an edge or something, and I open my eyes quickly, and I'm just thinking, how do you accomplish something like this? How do you fly down a mountain at 50 miles an hour with your eyes closed? You do it because you listen to the person in front of you. You trust them, and you rely on them. It's a great reminder to me that there is no obstacle to anything we do, you know, here on the mountain or back at home. And if you surround yourself with great people and trust them and allow them to lead and empower them, you know, you can overcome anything, you can accomplish anything if you feel your way and get it done. Reclaiming my experience of skiing has taught me that we can never say no to our ambitions. <laughs> What it has renewed is a dream, a reoccurring dream that I've had all my life of being on the mountain. And I can't uh, thank Eric enough for that inspiration. And I would really just like to say the entire Cox Automotive family, thank you. And let's rally around the spirit of no barriers. Dealers and friends, today's discussion will challenge many of our industry's current practices. But let's start with one universal truth that won't be challenged. The best outcomes occur when dealers optimize between turn and gross. This remains true. Yet, over the years, how to optimize that balance has changed many times. And now is one of those times. To explain why, Let's start with how it's changed in the past. Historically, I think we can all agree the balance looked like this. Dealers put the emphasis on gross, pushing gross up high at the expense of turn. But then this guy Dale Pollock comes along with a crazy idea. The idea that if you flip that emphasis and you do it with discipline on every car, in every situation, really pushing up on turn, moving all your inventory faster and faster. Something interesting happens. Other factors come into play, and the one-for-one trade-off is broken. 
pushing turn up high enough, consistently enough, would actually increase gross as well. Well, total gross, that is. An important part of his idea was recognizing that total gross is the true end game, and that with enough turn, total gross will rise even as average gross dips. This is the idea we called velocity. And this is where we were for a good run. Velocity had proven itself as a one size fits all solution and the industry accepted the norm that total gross is what should be focused on. That is, until it wasn't. Over time, Velocity worked so well that it wasn't just one size fits all for every car. It became the one size fits all methodology for every competing software solution and the one size fits all best practice for every dealership. So, the race to the bottom began. Ever faster turn and ever shrinking margins threw off the equilibrium. It became clear that there was a point at which average gross could dip too low and begin to pull down total gross in a way that more turn cannot overcome. Around mid-2017, Dale began to recognize this condition and, as you might imagine, began obsessing about developing a solution. And while a solution was developed, by 2020, it seemed much less necessary. The pandemic delivered a reprieve from the challenges of margin compression and the race to the bottom. It was not because velocity worked again. It was because suddenly anything worked. New car production halted, month after month supply shrunk and demand grew. Used vehicle values skyrocketed and dealership profitability was unprecedented. But if there's a lesson to be learned, it's not that anything works will always continue. It's how unpredictable it all was and how unfamiliar these new times have become. Unprecedented, unpredictable, unfamiliar. These are probably the most lasting effects on our times. Change is the only constant. Market conditions that were once easy to follow are now fragmented and volatile. Different vehicle segments, different price points, different categories, all move in different directions. There really is no one used car market anymore, but many markets that move dynamically, day to day, week to week, month to month. Velocity had passed its prime before the pandemic, but now as the pandemic recedes and we enter the new normal of constant change, Velocity is no match for the challenges ahead. No one size fits all method can be. And for this reason, now is the time for change. Now is the time to move beyond velocity management to a method we call variable management. Variable management still believes there's an ideal number of days for a car to sell, but that number is not the same for every car. As a result of unmatched data science, variable management understands every vehicle's unique profit potential and recommends actions tailored to each unit of inventory to optimize its ROI. It factors in the specifics of your market and the specifics of your dealership at every moment of decision. Where velocity management was a blanket, one size fits all approach, variable management is dynamic, responsive, and precise. And to take us through how it works, let's welcome Viato's founder and Cox Automotive's executive vice president, Dale Pollack. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm truly honored to be here. I have to say that uh, I love being in Canada. Uh, I have found over the years that the people in Canada are truly caring and kind people and very sensitive to people like me who have uh, impairment or disability. It's really a wonderful place to visit and to be. So thank you all for being who you are. And thank you for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. Um, I also want to express my sincere thanks to our great business partners at Trader Canada. It's been a lot of years that we've worked together, and it's not often that two big companies come together and, and really make meaning in the universe as well and as long as we have together. So I want to thank Matt, Lawson, Claris, Edwin, and all of the all of the Trader Canada people who have made this event possible and who've made us uh, work together and have had us find success together. So thank you all for what you do. I, I also have some very special team members 
from the other side of the border that I want to recognize uh, Tim Nadu, uh, Francois Denny, um, Jen Ness, and all of our performance managers who many of you work with and have worked with through the years. Thank you all for the hard work that you do. So I'm here today to share a very important message with you. And it's, it's, it's a message that involves a new strategy, a very important new strategy for managing success in used vehicle operations. But I think it's fair to ask the question, why do we need a new strategy? And I believe the answer to that is that, you know, the world changes and it certainly has changed quite a bit in the last several years. But if we can remember before the pandemic, what we we're all experiencing in the used car industry, it was pretty stressful. We had a lot of trouble as dealers making gross profit. We had trouble making net profit. And, you know, in those years leading up to the pandemic, 2017, 18, and 19, dealers would often say to me in those very margin compressed times, they would say to me, you know, Dale, if everybody followed your advice, did this velocity management thing that you said they should do, would there eventually be a race to the bottom? and nobody could make any money. And that was certainly seemingly what was starting to happen. But I used to say, no, I don't think so. Sometimes I would even say, you know, if I gave everybody the same set of golf clubs, would they shoot the same score? Well, in retrospect, I was wrong. And I'll admit it and I'll own it. I was wrong. There was a race to the bottom. And I don't believe that I created the race to the bottom. I think the race to the bottom that we all experienced in the used car industry in those years leading up to the pandemic was really a consequence of the internet. You know, when the internet creates transparency and efficiency in the market where buyers and sellers have access to the same information, margins compress. There's a lot of once great businesses that no longer exist today because of the internet. So I think that the internet eventually would have created the margin compression and ultimately the race to the bottom, whether or not I had ever come along. But what I did begin to realize by 2017 is that I had responsibility for accelerating it. And that for me is a pretty, was a pretty big problem because I owe everything I have to car dealers. My father was a car dealer. I was a car dealer for 13 years. But most importantly, thousands of people like you had put their trust in me. And I began to realize that my continuation of continuing to, to go on and prophesize the benefits of this velocity strategy and management was no longer serving the interest of dealers. It was no longer serving the interest of the industry. And I'm going to tell you something that if I can't help you, I'm not going to hurt you. And I began to realize that that's what was going on. So I gave serious consideration in 2017 to hanging it up, to retiring and, and riding off in, into the sunset. I, I just felt that perhaps I had done what I could do in the industry and it was time to move on. But before I was willing to move on, I felt a very strong commitment. I felt a strong commitment to the people I work with. I felt a strong commitment to Trader Canada and Cox Automotive. I felt uh, most importantly, a strong commitment to people like you who had put their trust in me to see if there wasn't a better way forward. And God is my witness. I had zero confidence that we could find a better strategy, a better way forward in the used car industry. I mean, after all, how many ways can there be to operate a successful used car operation? But in fact, we did find a better way forward. And that's why I'm still here. And that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Of course, the pandemic came along and changed everything that we knew to be true. And then for a good long while, we didn't need a better way forward. We didn't need any strategy, any strategy worked. But as, as we now are beginning to understand those very fortunate conditions that favored us in the industry, during the pandemic are beginning to recede. And what we're beginning to see now are some of those same conditions reappear that were challenging to us 
prior to the pandemic. And I do think there are going to be some differences going forward, at least for a while. But I do believe that what we're headed for are market conditions that are going to be very challenging, that are going to be margin compressed. And consequently, a different strategy is at least worth considering. So at that point in time, when I was searching to see if there wasn't just something we could do to pull ourselves out of what was happening, this, this intense margin compression, I, I began to wonder about something. And it was really at that time, nothing more than a hunch that I had. So I began to wonder why it might be that every other commercial industry in the entire world that I had ever become familiar with all had some recognition of and some appreciation for something called return on investment, ROI, return on investment. But yet in our used car industry, there's absolutely no appreciation, no recognition of this thing called ROI, return on investment, in spite of the fact that we make millions and millions of dollars of investment in vehicle inventory assets. None of us have ever sat in a used car management meeting and have reviewed the return on investment on our vehicle sales. And I began to wonder back in 2017 why that might be. Was it possible that just maybe, just maybe there's something there that we're missing in our industry? So I began to talk to colleagues and I began to talk to dealer friends like you. Why is it that we don't have any appreciation or recognition for this concept called return on investment on our vehicle inventory investments? And the most common response that I would get, particularly from dealers and managers, is, oh, we do. We do have recognition and appreciation for returning returns on these investments. Well, I'm going to prove to you today that we might think we do, but we don't. And in fact, not only do we not have an approach to managing used vehicle investments to optimize the return on these investments, what I'm going to prove to you is what we do in our industry is actually designed to suboptimize, suboptimize the return on these vehicle investments. I'm going to prove that to you before we finish. But let me just begin that case of proof that we do not in our industry have appreciation for recognition of return on investment with an illustration. Suppose I told you that you sold a used vehicle and made a $2,500 front end gross. I'm pretty sure that every single one of us would say, well, that's a pretty good outcome. A $2,500 front end gross on the sale of a used vehicle, pretty good outcome. And it might be a pretty good outcome, but it might not. Or it might not be nearly as good as we think it is. But presently in our industry, we don't have any ability to recognize this fact. So let me continue the illustration a little bit further. Suppose I told you that you sold a $50,000 unit in 60 days and made $2,500. Is that the same outcome for your used car business as if you sold a $15,000 unit in 20 days and made a $2,500 front end gross? They are the same two grosses, but are they the same two outcomes for your used car business? And when I put it to you that way, I'm pretty sure that all of you would say, no, they're different. And they are, in fact, different. They're two completely different ROIs. But yet, in our industry, we don't have any appreciation for this fact. And you want some proof of that? If you saw two deals on your sales log today, both of which grossed $2,500, not one of us would ask the question, wait a minute, how much did we have to invest? And how long did we have to hold that investment to make that $2,500? Not one of us would even think to ask those questions. And therein lies just the beginning of the proof that we do not manage used vehicle investments with an eye towards optimizing the return. Because if we did, we would ask those questions every time, and yet we never do. So I began to think 
that just maybe, just maybe there might be something here that we're missing. This appreciation for optimizing our inventory investments for their return. So back in 2017, with this notion, looking for a better way forward, I had two things going for me. The first thing is that I'd had the privilege of doing business with thousands of dealers for well over a decade. So we had a database with several million historical used car transactions, vehicles that we'd seen come and go through dealers' inventories over the past decade. And the second thing I had going for me then, as I do today, is the benefit of some really brilliant people. So here's what we did back in 2017. We took a couple million historical used vehicle transactions and we broke them up into three categories. The ones that achieved the highest return on investment when they got delivered, the medium ROI, and then the bottom third. The ones that achieved little, if any, and very often a negative return on investment. We broke them up into high, medium, and low ROI transactions. And then what the data people did is they went about the task to see if they could find common characteristics of vehicles while they were in inventory before they sold that correlated to their ultimate ROI performance when they got sold. And what the data people discovered is that there were, in fact, several elements that had a statistical correlation to their ultimate ROI performance when they got delivered. But among all of the features or characteristics or elements of these vehicles that we could identify that had some correlation, there were three that stood out far and away among all the others as having the highest statistical correlation to their ultimate ROI performance. And I'm going to share those with you, but not one of them is going to surprise anybody. So as it turns out, the first thing that we can identify about a used vehicle before it sells, while it's in the dealer's inventory, that actually is a high predictive quality in terms of how it's going to perform from an ROI standpoint when it gets sold, is simply how right you own it, measured by its cost to market. And I think that just makes intuitive sense, right? Because when we own a car right, it's much more likely to make a large gross profit. And the gross profit is one of the three elements of ROI, along with how much did we have to invest and how long did we have to hold it to make that profit. So how right we own the vehicle, it's cost to market, I think just makes intuitive sense is being predictive or correlated to its ultimate ROI performance. And then the second element we could identify in a vehicle while it's in inventory before it sells is, it's market day supply. And I think that makes sense as well, right? Because when we have a vehicle in inventory, it's got high demand and short supply. We often don't have to discount it or discount it as much. Once again, leading to a higher gross, one of the three elements of, of the ROI calculation. And then the third element, as it turns out, that has a very high statistical correlation to the vehicle's ultimate ROI performance is its popularity in the market simply measured by its level of retail volume. And I think that's intuitively obvious as well. So recognizing that each one of these three aspects of a vehicle has a high statistical correlation to its ultimate return on investment performance, what the data people did back in 2017 is they melded those three factors, cost to market, market day supply, and retail volume together into what we call an investment score. And I'll explain in a moment how that investment score works. But suffice it to say, it's important to understand that those three elements, cost to market, market day supply and volume, are not all equally weighted. This is where the real data science comes in. What we discovered is that the weighting of those three factors will vary from car to car based on a whole variety of conditions. And that really is a whole different discussion that gets us down in the weeds. But suffice it to say, the cost of market, market day supply, and retail volume in proper weighting pushed together can actually predict the probability of the vehicle's ROI long before it sells. So we started to iterate and, and figure out what the conditions were that, that required the modification of the weighting of those three factors until we got it to a point in late 
fall of 2018, nearly a year later, we got it to a point where we could actually predict the ROI of a vehicle before it's sold better than 90% of the time. Better than 90% of the time, we could predict the ROI of the vehicle while it's in inventory before it sells better than 90% of the time. So here's how that score works. It's on a scale of one to 12. So a vehicle in a dealer's inventory in a given day that would receive an investment score of 12 would be a vehicle that we could predict before it sells with almost absolute certainty that when it does sell, it will achieve among the highest return on investments. That would be a vehicle that'd be characterized by a low cost to market, the dealer owns it really right. It's got a low market day supply and it's a high volume mover in the market. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a vehicle in a dealer's inventory that might receive an investment score of one on a given day would be the opposite. It would be a vehicle that we could predict with almost absolute certainty that when it sells, it will achieve little, if any, and very likely a negative ROI. That would be a vehicle characterized by high cost to market, the dealer owns it for a lot of money, maybe too much money. It's got a high market day supply and it's a low volume mover in the market. So we put a score starting in 2018, we started putting a score of one through 12 on every vehicle, no longer in our historical database, but now in our live database. And then we would watch when that vehicle sells to see if the prediction of the investment score actually matched the outcome. And as I said, by late fall of 2018, we got it to a point where we could predict the ROI better than 90% of the time. Pretty fascinating. And then what we did just to simplify it a little bit is we took those investment scores of one through 12, we broke them down into four buckets. Vehicles in a dealer's inventory in a given day that would score 10, 11, or 12, we call those platinum vehicles. Ones that would score seven, eight, or nine, we call them gold. Four, five, or six, we call those silver. And the vehicles in a dealer's inventory in a given day that might score one, two, or three, we call those bronze vehicles. Now, there was a day in late 2018 when I asked the data people to do something. And when they showed me what they did, I couldn't believe it. It caused me to ask some other questions. And when they came back with the answer to one of those other questions, on that day in 2018, I knew two things to be true. Number one, I was not ready to ride off into the sunset. And number two, and this is crazy, number two, I knew then, as I know today, that what we discovered, what I'm going to share with you today, will eventually, not overnight, will eventually change the way that every single dealer manages used vehicle inventory. That's a crazy claim. That's a really crazy claim. And I would expect to be judged on it, that we would eventually change the way that every single dealer manages used vehicle inventory. So what was it that I asked the data people to do that led to the question that led to those two conclusions? Well, one day, late 2018, I said to the data people, I said, you know, we're putting these investment scores and classifying them in these four precious metal buckets on millions of cars every day, watching the outcomes. And those millions of cars were live inventory on behalf of what was then about 12,000 some odd dealers. I said, do this. I said, roll them all up as if they're just one big enterprise and show me what their inventory looks like in these four precious metal buckets. And this is what they showed me. Now, there may be several things here that are worth questioning and discussing. But there's one thing on this screen that should just jump off and hit us right between the eyes is being patently, patently irrational. And if you haven't already noticed what that is, it's these, it's these bronze vehicles 
The vehicles that these 12,000 some odd dealers own for the most amount of money, in many cases, too much money, that had the highest market day supply and the lowest retail volume in the market, these are the cars that they have priced most proudly. Bless you. Most proudly. As if, as if they want to keep them around as long as possible. Like the longer they stick around, they get better. And we know that isn't true. And on the other side, these platinum vehicles, the vehicles they own for the best money, that have the lowest market day supply, the highest retail volume sellers in the market, these are the vehicles they have priced as if they're distressed, like they needed to be blown out of here yesterday. And to anybody who has spent more than a minute in the car business, this makes no sense. Nobody who has spent more than a minute in the car business can look at that and put any rational explanation to it. We all know it should look the opposite. This is what I refer to as an inverted pricing profile. Every single one of us would agree that we should be most proud of these platinum cars the ones we own for the best money with the lowest market day supply, the most popular cars in the market. And we should have the highest degree of urgency to move these bronze cars, the ones we're heavy in, that have high supply, low demand, and low, low volume movers. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe this. This represented several million vehicles represented across 12,000 semi dealers. So I said to the data people, I said, go back and unravel this. Tell me how many of these 12,000 some odd dealers actually have a rational pricing profile, where they're pricing their platinum vehicles the highest and their bronze vehicles the most aggressively. And when they came back with the answer, that's when I knew. That's when I knew I wasn't ready to go off. And that's when I knew that eventually, will change the way that every single dealer manages inventory. Because you know what the answer was? You know how many of these 12,000 some odd dealers that's represented had a rational pricing profile? Zero, not one, not a single one. And what I could prove to you today is that every single one of you, I can prove it has a irrational or suboptimal pricing profile. Every single dealer, US, Canada alike, every single dealer has an irrational suboptimal pricing profile. How could this be true? How could you ever say that every dealership does anything alike? let alone something that makes no rational sense. How could this possibly be true? And yet it is. Well, today we have a pretty good understanding why this is the case. And the first of these two reasons, I'm gonna show you right now in another short video. Imagine a banana. We can all understand the ripeness of a banana, that it goes through stages over time. On day one, it's a green banana full of potential with lots of time ahead. A few days pass and you have a perfectly ripe banana. It's in its prime, but it won't stay like this forever because a few more days go by and then you have a bruised banana. I mean, this is not good. It's time is running out and may have already passed. If you were selling it, you'd give it a heavy discount or expect to throw it out soon because after a few more days pass, things get ugly. You've got a gooey, rotten banana, and you've got to get rid of it because it stinks. Okay, you see where this is going, right? In some ways, cars are like bananas. Profit potential, like ripeness, will diminish over time. But unfortunately, cars aren't exactly like bananas. Unfortunately, our challenge is a bit more complex. For one thing, while most bananas age pretty consistently, different cars can age at very different rates from each other. So imagine two cars shown here on day one with their profit potential high, represented as green bananas. By day 15 in your inventory, the profit potential of both cars settle in. 
Here, let's represent this as both cars being perfectly ripe bananas. But by day 30, it's not uncommon for one vehicle to hold its potential longer than the other. Here, the first car is holding strong, while the second car has become a bruised banana. And by day 45, the factors that make that first car a high potential vehicle still remain high. It's still perfectly ripe. While car two has dropped off the table, it's a gooey, rotten banana on your lot, and it's got to go. So, what does saying that these cars are both at day 45 tell you about each one's profit potential? Nothing. Day 45 tells you nothing, but hold that thought. There's another way the car challenge is more complex. With cars, you're not always working with a green banana on day one. Bruised, perfectly ripe, green. Vehicles can be at any stage when you take them in. You might even be taking home a gooey, rotten banana on day one. Maybe by accident, but maybe on purpose. Maybe you chose to buy a rotten banana to close another deal. And if that's the case, what is saying that this car is on day one telling you about the profit potential of that investment? The answer is nothing. Saying a car is on day one or day 45 means nothing. The calendar tells you nothing about the profit potential of any given car. Do you see the problem? In both of these scenarios, and many more scenarios throughout the industry, the calendar is the problem. The calendar is an old and crude form of technology, and it tells us nothing about the value of these investments. It's a flawed way of thinking about it, left over from a different time. We may believe it without even questioning it, but we've got to realize calendar time does not equal profit potential. Calendar time does not equal profit potential. So you see the first reason why every single dealer has an irrational suboptimal pricing profile is that every pricing decision on every used vehicle is made on a flawed premise. And whenever you make any decision on a flawed premise, you will often make suboptimal and sometimes downright irrational decisions. So what is the flawed premise upon which every single used vehicle is priced? It's crazy. It's bizarre. For some reason, we believe that the number of times the sun, a star in the sky, has risen in the east and set in the west over our vehicle somehow is an accurate measurement of the opportunity that that vehicle holds. The number of days that we happen to have held the vehicle, the number of calendar days that we actually happen to have owned the vehicle is somehow an accurate measurement of that vehicle's opportunity? Well, one of the most important discoveries we made you ready for this? What we now know is that more than 50% of the vehicles in a dealer's inventory on its first day of inventory life, more than 50% are brown and rotten bananas. But what does the calendar say to the person pricing the vehicle about every vehicle on its first day of inventory life? The calendar says they're all green bananas and therefore, we should go for all the gross. And what we now know is that is wrong more than 50% of the time. So let's think about it differently. Instead of selling cars for profit, we sell bananas. And today you get a shipment of new inventory. And you open that box and to your surprise, they're not all green bananas. There's some green, some yellow, some brown, and some rotten bananas. Now, if you were a smart, prudent business person with an eye towards optimizing your investment return on that set of inventory, the first thing you would do would be to grab those rotten bananas, and people do buy rotten bananas, they make banana bread, you'd stick those on the shelf immediately and price them super, super cheap to sell fast. 
And then second, you'd go get those brown bananas, put those on the shelf next and price them just a little bit higher. And then you'd go get the yellow bananas third, put those on the shelf, price them even higher. And last, you'd put those green bananas on the shelf and price them the highest. That is what any rational, prudent business person would do with an eye towards optimizing the investment return on that set of inventory. It just happens to be exactly opposite of what we do in the car business. And then we wonder why in those very margin compressed times of the past and the times like that that will reoccur in the future, then we wonder why we are not achieving the investment return that we're entitled to. No kidding. We're all doing it wrong. We're all doing it wrong on this crazy, bizarre belief that the star in the sky is somehow an accurate measurement of the opportunity that a vehicle holds. And it's not that the sun in the sky doesn't have any relevance to a vehicle's opportunity. It does have some, but it is so imprecise. It is so flawed. And yet you have to admit it's the primary, maybe not the only, but it is a primary, perhaps the primary consideration on the part of a pricing manager, how they should price the vehicle on any given day. How many times that star has risen and set over the, over the vehicle? You know it, it, it's happening that way. And, and again, it's imprecise. It's very imprecise. It's very inaccurate. And you can get away with uh, using an imprecise system of measurement to price your vehicles under good conditions. Under good conditions, it works good enough. But you get a margin compressed environment and its flaws really begin to surface. And this is what we were experiencing in those years leading up to the pandemic. And then, of course, the pandemic came along and everything changed for the better. And it was wonderful. We didn't need to worry about, you know, this imprecise measurement of pricing vehicles. But now that we're coming out of the pandemic and beginning to realize a lot of those same conditions that we're setting up prior to the pandemic, this is where we're headed. So the first of these reasons why every single dealer has an irrational suboptimal pricing profile is that we're all making pricing decisions largely driven by an assumption, a flawed assumption, that the number of calendar days that we happen to uphold the vehicle actually measures properly the opportunity that that vehicle holds. It just simply isn't true. But there's yet another reason that every single dealer has a suboptimal and very often irrational pricing profile, and it has to do with human nature and past experience. So you see, if you were able to come to work today and see a vehicle on its first day of inventory life that's in distress, why? Because we own it for too much money, maybe, you know, it has high market day supply and it's a low volume mover. Let me ask you a question on day one, who wants to jump on that grenade? Nobody. Nobody. You know what we'll do. You know exactly what we'll do if we could see a vehicle on day one in distress for those reasons. You know what we'll do. We'll say, well, let, let's give it a chance. Let's give it some time. We'll kick the can down the road. This is human nature. You see, every single car is priced by a human being. And every single human being has a brain that's wired to avoid pain and loss. Imagine how miserable our lives would be if we woke up in the morning wired to go out and find situations involving pain and loss. We do the opposite. We avoid them as long as we can. Some of us more than others, but we all do it. So if we could recognize a vehicle on its first day of inventory life in distress, we're gonna kick the can down the road. It's just human nature. This is what's happening in our dealerships. And you know what past experience likely would have done for us when we did kick that can down the road? It likely would have rewarded us because when that market was less efficient and transparent, when, when all these buyers and shoppers didn't have all the information they have today at their fingertips, it only would have been a matter of time before somebody would come along who didn't know better 
paid us too much money taking that vehicle off of our hands. So this is what's happening in our dealerships. We are pricing vehicles on a very, very flawed instrument of measurement. And we got human nature working against us. And again, these things work well enough when times are good. But when times get a little tougher, margins start compressing the, the, the shortcomings of, of these realities begin to surface in a very serious way. But the fact is, for these reasons, every single dealer is pricing vehicles in a manner designed to suboptimize the return on their investment. So let me tell you some good news and some bad news. And I'll start with the bad news. The bad news is that this is a very, very hard problem to correct. I wish I could tell you it was simply as easy as buying some new software. It's not that easy. Because you see, if I am going to ask you to begin to think and behave with respect to these vehicle investments of ours, like a prudent, rational business person would with an eye towards optimizing the return, it's gonna cause you to violate all sorts of well-established, quote unquote, good principles of used car management, all sorts of them. And I could give you dozens of examples, just a couple to give you an idea what I'm talking about. If you could come to work today and see a vehicle on its first day of inventory life in distress for those reasons I told you, we own it for a lot of money, maybe too much money. It's got high market day supply and low retail volume. The smartest thing you could do on that vehicle on day one would be to price it to move it quickly. Now that price could be a zero profit price. It could be a loser price. Do you think if you were to put a zero profit or loser price on such a vehicle on its first day of inventory life, anybody in the dealership today would come along and pat you on the back and say, way to go, good thinking, good job. No, nobody would do that. And if you did it repeatedly, you could probably get fired for doing it. And you know I'm right. Give me another example. You're working a deal on a platinum car. One of the reasons why it's platinum is you own the car for $2,000 under the money. There's no trade, there's no F&I, and here comes the offer, it's an $1,800 offer. I know what you guys will do. You know what you'll do. We all know what you'll do. You'll take the deal because that's what we are trained to do as car people. If there's any daylight, we roll the car. Be damned the fact that we own it for two Gs under the money. It's going down and you know I'm right. So you can just begin to understand that if you are really a prudent, rational business person, the smartest decision you could make would be to say thank you, but no thank you to that offer. Because if you are willing to be a little bit more patient, that vehicle all day long will make a three, four, five thousand dollar front end gross profit but we won't give it that chance because that's not how we're trained to think and behave. And I could give you dozens of other examples. So you see what we're dealing with here is deep rooted culture of how we do things. And you don't change that overnight. You don't change that easily. You don't change that just by buying some new software. The only reason that you could ever expect anybody to change their thinking and behavior, particularly when it's hard, is if they understand why it makes sense to do it differently. And that's why I'm here today. Why it makes sense to do it differently. Because the way we're doing it today is not rational, it's not optimal. And it may have worked well enough for you over the last few years. It may be working well enough for you today, the way you're doing it, but it won't always work. I mean, this industry is cyclical. We'll go through good times and bad times. And we have come out of some of the best times that perhaps our industry has ever seen. 
but it's getting tougher and it will continue to get tougher. So maybe you don't need to do anything different today. Maybe irrational suboptimal pricing of our investments, maybe it's good enough for you today. And if it is, that's fine, but it won't always be. So this is a really hard problem. I've come to understand it's really frustratingly hard. Everybody in the dealership has got to understand why we're gonna start doing something different if you have any chance of actually being successful doing it. So that's the bad news. But I'll tell you, there is some really good news. But before I get to the good news, I wanna make a point very, very clear because it's important. If we go back to that composite I showed you a few moments ago, if when you see your inventory through this new lens, this investment lens, which we're capable of showing all of you today or any time hereafter, you're gonna see that your inventory seen through this new investment lens has a lot of similarities to this national composite representing 12,000 some odd dealers. And specifically what I'm talking about is what you're gonna see is that a large percentage of your inventory is in the silver bronze category. And I want you to understand what that does not mean. That does not mean that you're making bad investment decisions. I'm not saying there aren't some bad investment decisions, but the fact that every single dealership has 40, 50, 60% or more of their inventory in the silver bronze category does not reflect bad acquisition decisions. What it does reflect is the unfortunate reality of today's very transparent, very efficient wholesale market. You see, it's not just the retail market where everybody today is armed with information and tools and you know everybody's an expert. It's also the wholesale market. The wholesale market, like the retail market over the past decade, has become a very efficient market. Everybody in the wholesale market, buyer and seller alike, they're all armed and equipped today with much better information and data and tools to make better decisions. And at, as that efficiency, as that efficiency builds, margins compress. So there's no auction, no auction that you're going to go to to get a low market day supply high volume popular car and get it cheap. There's no auction like that. And yet sometimes you have to go to auction to buy cars to fill holes. And even trading customers for cars. Today, these shoppers today know so much better than they ever used to about what the true value of their car is. How often can you get a low market day supply popular car on trade and get it cheap? Not very often, but yet you have to trade and make deals. So there's absolutely no shame whatsoever in having a large percentage of your inventory in the silver and bronze category. In fact, you can't avoid it. But can I tell you where there is shame? In not recognizing these vehicles for what they are. They're high risk vehicles and not treating a high risk investment as any prudent business person would treat a high risk investment. Make it go away quickly. Get your money out of it sooner rather than later. That's where they're shame. Not recognizing and not treating those vehicles as a prudent business person would. But having the vehicles and having them in large quantity, no shame. You can't avoid it. It's just the reality of the business. So with that understanding, let me tell you some really good news. I'm gonna tell you that two things will happen with certainty. And I don't use the word certainty lightly. I've lived on the earth long enough to know there aren't many things you can say with certainty. But I'll stake my reputation on these two things happening with certainty if you can reverse your irrational suboptimal pricing profile. And the first thing that will happen with certainty is that your volume will soar and it will soar quickly. How's that gonna happen? <laughs> well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a significant percentage of the investment you have on your lot right now, these silver and bronze cars, which likely are 40, 50, 60% of your inventory right now sitting on your lots this moment that are priced not to sell. And you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna price them to sell. 
And you know what they're going to do? They're going to sell fast. Now, you might say to me, but Dale, if I do that, we'll have some bad grosses. We'll have some losses. And I might agree with you. You might. But the only thing you have to answer for me is, are you better off doing it now or later? Because they're not going to go away by themselves. You're eventually going to get around to pricing them to move. They're not going to evaporate. So the only question you have to answer is, is, are you better off doing it now or later? And you know the answer is now. These vehicles are depreciating assets. Now, it's not going to be all bad because while we're getting out of these silver and bronze cars faster, we're going to be putting a lot more people through the up and i process. We're going to be replacing these vehicles and making internal fixed gross. So you're going to make some of it. In some cases, you'll make all of it and more back. But what it is going to do unquestionably is to store your value. And you don't have to buy one more car to do it. In fact, you could probably stock fewer cars to do it. The second thing that's going to happen with certainty, and this is a hard one to, to get your head around, while we're moving out these silver and bronze cars faster, you know what's going to happen to your overall average gross while you're moving out these silver and bronze cars? It's going to rise. Now, how is that going to happen? How is that going to happen when you're getting out of these silver and bronze cars more quickly? Well, here's another really fascinating discovery, and this is one that gets me pretty exciting, excited and optimistic about the future. What we now understand is that there are some vehicles that are not price sensitive in terms of how quickly they sell, the relationship between their price and their turn. Other vehicles have little price sensitivity. So you know what we're going to do while we're moving out these silver and bronze cars? We're going to reprice. I'm, I'm, we're going to reprice our platinum and gold cars, but we're just not going to price them up. We are going to price them way, way up. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to turn really, really fast. We know this now. And let me tell you why there are some cars in your inventory that it almost doesn't matter how high you price them, they're gonna still move very, very fast? There are a couple of reasons. The first of these reasons, I think we as car people tend to overlook and not probably even wanna recognize. And that is that when our salespeople look at our inventory, you know what they see? They see varying levels of commissionable gross opportunity. And that absolutely matters in terms of why some vehicles sell fast, and why some vehicles sell. And for any of us who have sold cars, we know this is true. Because for any of us who have sold cars, we've all walked people to see cars they didn't come in for. We've all walked people around cars they did come in to see. Why did we do that? You know why we did it. We did it because we were attempting to optimize our incentive program. And this does matter. But there is yet another reason why there are some vehicles on your lot that have little, if any, price sensitivity to how quickly they turn. And you all have experienced this way as well. Have we not all seen this experience where a trade arrives and the plates have not even come off the trade yet? And our salespeople are already on the phone calling customers. We've all seen this. When does that happen? That happens when a vehicle shows up on your lot that's a popular car in the market that's in short supply, high demand, and the salespeople really want to sell that vehicle. Well, these are exactly the reasons why they're platinum and gold. So one of the most exciting discoveries we have made is that it almost doesn't matter how high you price these vehicles they are going to sell super, super fast. Haven't we done a good job convincing all of you that if we put a used vehicle on the internet without a price, it won't sell? Now we know that's not true. If it's a silver and bronze car, you can put that car all day long on the internet without a price, watch how quickly it sells. If it's truly a silver or gold car, put it on the internet and ask a million dollars for it. 
and watch how quickly that car sells. Now, it's obviously not going to sell for a million dollars, but people are going to blow up your phone, knock your door down saying you made a mistake or it's a joke, right? Come on, let's get serious. And generally, the higher you start, the more you end up with. I'm telling you, this is true. And these are the reasons why these cars are designated as platinum and gold, because your salespeople are highly incented to sell them. The market's craving them and they're in short supply. And these cars are sitting on your lot right now. And I can prove to you that the vast majority of those vehicles at your store are priced the cheapest. So your overall gross absolutely positively will rise. You know, it's so ironic that I've spent years of my professional career trying to convince managers to lower the price on their cars. They've argued with me. Well, these days I spend a lot of time trying to convince managers to raise the price on these plant and gold cars, and you're still arguing with me. And I'm like, why wouldn't you want to raise the price? And what you say to me is, well, if I raise the price, I won't get any eyeballs, I won't get any BDPs. And my first response is, well, why doesn't that seem to bother you on your silver and bronze cars? And once I get over that little bit of fun, I say, you know what? I said, I don't want you to get a lot of BDPs and eyeballs on these silver and gold cars because they don't need it. The only way you're gonna get a lot of BDPs and eyeballs on those cars is at the expense of your gross by lowering your price. And on these cars, you don't need to do it. So there's the good and the bad news. The bad news, this is a much harder problem to solve than we might wanna believe. Because what we're actually doing is we're changing a lot of long standing beliefs and culture about what is quote unquote, good used car management practice. And you don't do that quickly. You don't do that easily. The good news is there's a lot of reward, a lot of reward, but do you have to do it today? Maybe not. Maybe the market is generous enough at the current moment where you don't have to do anything different and that's okay. But I can tell you that if you are going to do something different in this market, you will do even better. How could you not do better? It's just plain rational. So let's take a step back and let's just think about from whence we came. Velocity to what I now call variable management. And this term variable management is a little bit unfortunate to the extent that we in our industry use the word variable operations to mean something different than what I'm talking about here, calling this strategy variable. I'll explain why I'm calling this variable, but it's not in the same context of meaning that we refer to new and used vehicle sales operations as variable operations. It's a different meaning in this context. So if we think about what did velocity management really say to the industry and say to dealers, if, if you really boil it down, what it basically said is price every car as competitively as you can, as fast as you can, the more return, the better. And I think that worked and worked really well until everybody started to do it. Now that we have the benefit of data science and discovery, what we now understand is that each vehicle holds its own inherent level of risk and opportunity. And if you're willing to believe, which I think at some level we've all really have known in the past, if we're willing to accept the fact that every single vehicle in our inventory holds a different level of risk and reward opportunity, doesn't it just make rational sense to treat each vehicle in a variable manner. Instead of saying all vehicles should be priced as competitively as possible, as fast as possible, like a one size fits all approach, move them all out as fast as possible. Now that we can identify the inherent potential and risk in each unique vehicle, doesn't it just make rational sense to take a varied management approach to each one of these vehicles, to give each vehicle its opportunity to achieve its highest potential? And maybe the analogy that I would offer you on this is like being a good parent. I mean, does being a good parent mean that we treat our kids all the same or give them all the same things? I don't think so. I think what being a good parent means 
is the ability to perceive in each child their inherent strengths and weaknesses, and then hopefully have the ability to provide each child that which they need to achieve their maximum potential. I think that's what being a good parent is. Now, if we just simply took that same thinking to managing our used vehicle inventory, now that we can see the strengths and weaknesses of these vehicle investments, largely defined by their cost to market, market day supply, and retail volume and proper weighting, now that we can perceive pretty accurately, not perfectly, but pretty accurately, their strengths and weaknesses, and consequently, their inherent risk and reward profile, doesn't it just make rational sense to provide each vehicle an opportunity to achieve its highest potential? Some cars deserve more, some cars deserve less. I mean, think about this. You stepped up to make a deal. You took in a trade. You put a lot of money in it for whatever reason. Now you took in a car. It's a bronze car. Sitting out back of the shop, there's 10 waiting to come in. Should that one become number 11? No, it should go to the front of the line because that vehicle has a profile of risk that's greater potentially than the other ones that are sitting out back. And consequently, as a prudent business person, it just makes sense, rational sense for us to treat that vehicle differently. If that vehicle comes to inventory and it shows us a profile of strength because of how right we own it, it's low market day supply and it's high degree of popularity in the market, doesn't it just make rational sense for us to treat that vehicle pricing wise in a manner to give that vehicle, that child, an opportunity to achieve its maximum potential? How can that not be right? It's just rational. Unless you want to believe that all these vehicles hold exactly the same level of risk and reward, and therefore we should treat them all the same, it just makes rational sense. Now that we can clearly, not, I don't hesitate to overstate it, not perfectly, but pretty accurately, we can derive and define a vehicle's strength and weaknesses, and consequently its risk and reward profile. How can it not be right, therefore, to say, let's treat each vehicle in a manner designed to allow that vehicle to achieve its maximum potential? How can that not be right? So what we're moving from is a one-size-fits-all approach, variable management, which implicitly assumes every vehicle holds the same level of risk and reward, and therefore we treat them all the same, to a variable management approach. We're now with the ability to, to perceive pretty accurately, not perfectly, but pretty accurately, the, the vehicle's risk and reward profile. I'm simply asking us to treat each vehicle in a way designed to allow it to achieve its maximum potential, some sooner, some later. So that brings me to yet another challenge to conventional wisdom, and it has to do with aging. Let me tell you what I believe, and let me tell you what I don't believe. I believe, and I always have and always will, that a dealership should have a policy. But what I no longer believe, because now I know better, is that it should be the same policy for every vehicle. So I'm going to ask you to think about your age policy differently in two respects. The first respect might seem a little trite because maybe all I'm doing is changing a word, but sometimes words matter. And I think sometimes words matter a lot. I think this is one of the contexts where words might matter a lot. I would be very, very satisfied if we never again talked about having an age policy. We're not here to age vehicles. We're not museum curators. We're salespeople. We're here to turn vehicles. So rather than talking to our people and our dealerships about having an age policy, I'd rather talk to them about having a turn policy. I think that describes more accurately what our mission is. We're not here to age and we're here to turn. Them. So, okay, maybe it's just a change of a word, but I, I would think it's just a healthier mindset to talk about having a turn policy rather than an age policy, but call yours what you will. The second way I'm going to ask you to think differently about your policy, whether you call it age or turn, is more fundamental. As I said, I no longer believe, because now I know better, that every vehicle deserves the same policy. 
some vehicles need to be moved out of here really quickly. And other vehicles, given their inherent opportunity profile, we should give a longer chance to. We should be willing to be more patient because if we are willing to be more patient, they will reward us with better profits. So I think we should have a policy, but I no longer believe we should have the same policy. And think about it. <laughs> Unless you believe that every vehicle holds exactly the same level of risk and reward, how can it be rational to say every car should be out of here in 60 days or 45 or 90? How can that be right? That is such a blunt instrument approach to managing investments. It, it implicitly assumes that every car holds the same level of risk and reward. And we know that's not true. But yet, that is conventional wisdom in our industry. Yes, we should have a policy, and the policy should be the same for every vehicle. That's like saying our kids should all go to bed exactly at the same time every night. Well, you know, it just isn't optimal. It doesn't really address the reality that each one of these investments holds a different level of risk and reward. It's a blunt approach. And again, it might be good enough in good times, but it would be even better in good times if we were more nuanced in terms of how we approach these vehicles, in terms of our policy. So some cars deserve a longer chance, we should be more patient with. Some cars deserve a shorter chance, we should show more urgency. But what you'll see when you look at your investment profile of your pricing, you'll see that you're giving your toughest cars the longest chance and you're giving your best cars the least chance. And that just can't be optimal. It just It isn't rational. So what would it look like if it's done right? Well, this is what I think it might look like if it's done right. I'm going to give my best cars, my platinum cars, the ones I own for the best money that have the lowest market day supply, the most popular cars in the market. I'm going to give those cars an average of 50 days to turn. Would that offend anybody? If the cars that you own for the best money, the most popular cars, and short supply in the market, would it offend anybody if you gave those vehicles an average of 50 days to sell? I'm gonna give my gold vehicles 40, a policy of 40, my silver cars 30, and I want my bronze cars out of here in 20 days, 50, 40, 30, 20. How can that not be more rational than what we're doing today? unless you believe they're all exactly the same in terms of risk and reward potential. And you know that's not the case. 50, 40, 30, 20. It is much more rational. How can that not be right? How can that not be better? So then the question is, okay, how do I get my turn to look like that? My policy outcomes to actually look like that? Well, this is where I think we lose some people for a variety of reasons. We are at a place in the world today where data and technology can do some pretty amazing things. Today, we can predict the probability of any vehicle selling at any price in the next seven days. I'm gonna repeat that because I'd really like that to soak in. Today, with a high degree of accuracy, not perfect, but a high degree of accuracy, we can predict the probability of any vehicle selling at any price in the next seven days. Now, we don't want every vehicle to sell in the next seven days. We'd leave a lot of gross on the table. What we do want is we want vehicles to sell in a period of time designed to optimize their potential. And what does that look like? Well, 40, 50, 30, 20 might be what that looks like. So what we now are able to do with a high degree of accuracy, not perfectly, but with a high degree of accuracy, is we are able today to produce a recommended price range for every vehicle every day. And there's two really important words there, recommended and range, okay? Recommended, because it's not perfect. This system of predicting the probability of any vehicle selling at any price within a desired period of time it does have some blind spots. And fortunately today, we know what most of them are. 
So it still does require a good human being on the other end who knows the vehicle, knows the situation to vet these recommendations. So they should not all be accepted. And it's a range because again, there are still soft things that do matter that, that computer science or data may not in all cases necessarily be considering properly. So it still does require a good human. But here's what I can tell you. What I can tell you is if you are willing to accept a price within the range on most cars from day one, and that's key, from day one, your turn outcomes would look much more rational, much more like 50, 40, 30, 20, than your turn outcomes look today. Because when we show you your turn outcomes, what you're gonna see is that you're turning your best cars roughly in half or a third of the time that you're selling your riskiest cars. And that just can't be right. That just cannot be right. So data science today, it's not perfect. It's not gonna work properly on every car, I can guarantee you, but it's frightening how accurately it does work. It will work on the vast majority of cars if you gave it the chance. But you see, again, this is hard for a lot of reasons. I mean, there's a lot of ego and a lot of self-confidence in our industry, bless you. You know, there's a lot of, you know, doubt about data science and what's in a black box. I mean, I, I get all that. I get all that. But I'm not asking anybody to have blind faith. I am asking them to have faith to try it. But the beauty of the system is that it reports on itself every day. And if you were trying it and doing it and it did not reverse your irrational turn outcomes, you know what I'm talking about, what I just referred to, where you're selling your best cars and half the time of your tough, toughest cars. If it didn't reverse that, then you should quit. But it will reverse it. But it's hard. It's hard to try something new, to put aside our ego, to put aside our belief on what we think we should do in favor of data science. I get it. It's hard. I'm not telling you this is easy. So just a quick thought, what actually drives that algorithm that I talked about that can predict the probability of any vehicle selling at any price in the next seven days? One of the misconceptions is people assume it's driven by the fact whether it's platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. That has a small role, a small role in what generates those price recommendations. What generates those price recommendations in large part are hundreds of individual data points drawn from three general categories. Number one, everything we know about the car in question, which is mostly what you would have told us. Number two, everything we know about your current market for that vehicle. And number three, everything we know about your dealership's past experience and current inventory with that type of vehicle. So it very, very much learns the, 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 the individual nature you know, of, of every dealership's ability or inability to sell certain types of vehicles. And the more you use it, the more it learns. So it will not necessarily always give you a recommendation to price a platinum car at the high end of the competitive set. Sometimes it'll be the middle to the low if it's the case that for some reason your store doesn't do well with those vehicles or you're maybe you're currently overstocked. And similarly, on a bronze vehicle, it is not necessarily always going to give you a recommendation to price that vehicle at the low end, it might be the medium or the high end under the situation where for whatever reason, your store might do very well with that type of vehicle and you might be short on them. So the system is really smart. It's not perfect, but it's really, really smart. So what I've spoken to you about thus far is really all about strategy because I believe that the only thing that ever really creates sustainable performance improvement in a dealership is a good strategy well executed. So I'm here to, to make a case to you for moving from variable management or for moving from velocity management to variable management. It's not that velocity management was wrong. It, it worked really well until everybody started to do it and the market got too, too tough. Variable management is a data science approach that's completely rational, completely rational, recognizes the inherent differences in cars and simply asks you as managers of those investments to treat them as any prudent, rational person would with an eye towards optimizing their investment in light 
of their inherent risk and reward return. How can that not be right? Now I'm gonna conclude here by just spending a couple of minutes talking about software. And I'm not big on talking about software because as I said, I think that software is really not the key. But you know, while you all were having a lot of fun during the COVID time selling cars for list and over list, all my stuff was pretty irrelevant. <laughs> everything I've ever created, everything I've ever done has been premised on the belief that cars are depreciating assets. And there was a brief moment in our time, and you guys experienced it, maybe 18 months or so, where cars appreciated. And during that period of time, nobody needed to do this. I mean, nobody needed to do this. In fact, if you did the opposite, you would have been rewarded for it. But we know that you know was a weird moment. We know it's in the history books, probably not likely to ever come back. But while you guys were all having that fun, and I'm sitting at home twiddling my thumbs, I'm not doing nothing. I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's not time to go out and tell dealers what I just told you because they don't need it right now. But what could I do? What could I create for dealers that would really elevate, elevate and optimize their operational performance trying to execute the strategy? So what I came to understand or really think about, and I think you would all agree, is that you have to do a lot of things in used vehicle operations to have successful outcomes. But the big three, the three that matter more than anything else is daily price management, appraising management, and acquisition management. These are what I consider to be the big three, not the only three, but these are the ones where if you get these things right, it will make the biggest difference. So I started thinking during these COVID times, what can I do to elevate your level of operational performance to achieve better results in daily pricing, appraising and acquisition? So I'm gonna show you what I did in just one of the areas, but you can believe I've done something similar in the other two that is equally as compelling as what I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you how I've elevated the art and science of daily price management beyond a level that we've ever been able to have in the past in our industry. And it's a new pricing tool that I call the alignment tool. And I'm gonna show you how powerful this pricing daily price management alignment tool is with four examples, what I call rooftop A, B, C, and D. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is three core beliefs that are the foundation of this new system. Three things that I believe are realities of daily price management. The first is that the person in the dealership who's entrusted with pricing vehicles arguably holds the most power in the department in terms of the outcome of that department. They're like the captain of the ship. They've got the wheel in their hands. They're making decisions every day pricing your vehicles that have more to do with the outcome of that department at the end of the month than any other single person, arguably. The second belief system that I have about that job and that person is they're a human being. Even if they're guided by computer technology, they're a human being. And every single human being who comes to that role of pricing vehicles will inevitably bring bias and beliefs. And the third thing I believe, unfortunately, is the way it's being done in our dealerships today is more or less under the cover of darkness. Meaning that you don't really understand in a real sense how they've done that job until you get to the end of the month and the results are baked. So sometimes we get to the end of the month and we say, well, we had a good volume, but the gross is really poor. Or we had decent gross, but we didn't sell enough cars. I mean, doesn't that happen all the time? Well, you know what that, those outcomes are? They are the result of the collection of individual pricing decisions that they were made through the course of the month by that person under the cover of darkness. And unfortunately, under present technology systems of pricing vehicles, you don't have the ability to course correct. You don't have the ability to perceive how that captain is steering your ship until they already hit the shore, maybe not in the destination that you desire, not to your North Star, what I call your North Star. So with these foundational beliefs that this person holds an enormous amount of power, they're going to bring bias and beliefs to it inevitably, and they're doing it under the cover of darkness such that you don't really understand until you get to the end and it's too late and you can no longer course correct. I created this alignment tool.
And now let me show you how powerful it is. In this example, Rooftop A, for the first time in our history of operating dealerships, for the very first time, we can see the extent to which the person to whom we entrust this critical job of pricing vehicles actually is comfortable using data. So the first thing that we see here is that their prices are aligned 51% to the recommendations, meaning that 49% of the time, the captain of your ship looked at the dials on the dashboard and said, no thank you to the data science. Now listen, I don't make any judgments. That's not my job. It's for you. For the very first time objectively, you can see the extent to which the person who you entrust with this critical job actually is comfortable using data. If you're comfortable roughly 50-50 them, the saying, you know, I know better 50% of the time, if it's good for you, it's fine for me. But for the very first time, you can objectively discern this. I think that alone is a pretty good improvement. But wait, there's more. Because let's look at the 49% of the time the captain of your ship said no thank you to the dashboard data science. Where did their price that they chose land relative to the recommended range overwhelmingly? Well, we can see overwhelmingly their choice landed on the high side of the range. Now, what does this do for you to be able to see this? Well, let me tell you something. If that is the outcome of that person's bias or belief, I might have a problem with it. If it's intentional, I'm all about it. You see, this pricing profile that you can see every day is showing you that the person pricing your vehicle has a high bias towards gross. And there's nothing wrong with having a high bias towards gross, so long as it doesn't come too much at the expense of volume for you. Your North Star, your desired balance this month between volume and gross. If this is done intentionally to achieve the objective of really getting our gross up, maybe at the expense of our volume, then I say you can look at this and know that your ship is being steered directly to your North Star. But if this isn't your North Star and you can now see this happening and playing out day to day, you can course correct. You can sit down with this person and say, wait a minute, maybe we need to make some adjustments here so we get to the end of the month and we don't find ourselves too short of volume. How can that not be a significant benefit in an elevation of this important job of pricing vehicles on a daily basis? We've never had the ability to do this before. Let's look at rooftop B. What do we see here? Well, we see here that the captain of this ship has accepted the recommendations 43% of the time. In other words, 57% of the time, they said, no, thank you to data science. If that's okay with you, that's great. If you have that degree of confidence, fine. But maybe you don't. But for the very first time, now you can discern this. But more importantly, or equally as importantly, look at the pattern. The 57% of the time, the captain of your ship said, no, thank you, the data science, the price they chose, where did they land relative to the recommended range on the low side? So once again, what does that tell you about the way your ship is being steered? It's being steered towards volume. And again, nothing wrong with volume so long as it doesn't come too much for you at the expense of gross. But for the first time, you can see it. And because you can see it playing out day to day, you can course correct. So we don't get to the end of the month and say, oh my gosh, we sold a lot of cars, we didn't make enough gross. Now you can do something about it before it's too late. How powerful is that? Now, it's, if it's done intentionally, great. If it's done by, based on the bias of beliefs under the cover of darkness, not so great. Let's look at rooftop C. Unfortunately, this is the most common profile I see. And this one's never okay, never okay. Well, the first thing that we see once again is that the captain of our ship is not very much of a believer in data science. Okay, it is what it is for you to judge. But look at the pattern, look at the pattern. This is unfortunately the one that I see most commonly. This is the one that very likely is playing out in your store right now. We can see that when they reject the data science overwhelmingly on the silver and bronze cars, they land on the high side of the range. Why do you think that's happening? Well, you know why that's happening. They're pricing those vehicles high because they don't want to face reality. 
And it's understandable, it's human nature. It's just not good business. But now we can see it actually playing out in real time. But now the captain of this ship has a problem. You know what their problem is? They've got 40, 50, 6% of their inventory in the silver and bronze category that are priced not to move. Now they have a problem. They need volume. They need volume. So look at where they go to get volume. They get volume by cheap selling your best cars, the ones that are easy to price cheap. And this is never okay. This is never okay. And again, I can't stress it enough. This is the profile, what I call profile C, that I see most commonly at stores. How good for the very first time would it be for us to see this playing out in real time and have the ability to actually course correct? We've never had the ability to do this before. And then finally, rooftop D is what it looks like when it's done right. You know, overwhelmingly, maybe 85% of the time, they're saying yes to the data science. They shouldn't say yes 100%, not 90%. Maybe it's even 70, 75% is okay. But what we can see here is there's no discernible pattern in those instances where they say no thank you to the recommendation. Because what they're saying no thank you to is actually based on legitimate aspects of the vehicle that the system cannot recognize or the situation is not understandable to the data or to the system. So people are making good judgment decisions based on conditions and, and such. So rooftop D is what it looks like when it's done right. Now, as I said, while you guys were selling cars for list and over list, I'm not doing nothing. I created a similar system that is equally as compelling to manage our appraisers such that we have a smaller range in appraisers in terms of how they appraise vehicles and the appraisals they're making are more on target with our strategy. And we've done a similar thing with acquiring vehicles because we spend a lot of money acquiring vehicles, the process of acquiring vehicles, the process of investing in vehicles. And very often those vehicles aren't the right vehicles or they're not bought for the right money. So I've got an equally compelling case to show you, not today, but an equally compelling case to show you in the software where we've actually elevated the level of oversight and accountability that this system now gives you. And listen, I do understand that oversight and accountability can be discomforting to people who do these jobs. I, I get that. Believe me, I get that. But it's just good business. It's just good business when we can see these things happening, these big three happening in real time with real data so that we can course correct. So there you have it, a little bit about the software, but mostly about the strategy of variable management. And again, I'll close, I'll, I'm happy to answer questions here, but I just wanna close by saying that the system is not perfect. It's not a silver bullet to all the problems or issues that we have in the industry. But when you see your data, the fact that your pricing your highest risk investments, essentially not to sell, and your distress pricing, your best cars. You're selling your best cars in a third or half the time. You're hanging out your toughest cars twice as long, I should say. Nobody, nobody can defend that. It might be okay today if the times are generous enough to still be okay but you would all have to agree that what I'm speaking to you about is nothing less than completely rational behavior. But it, it, it's all premised upon data science. And I shouldn't say it's all premised. It's, it has a lot to do with data science. And you know, there's, a, there's an understandable skepticism and reluctance of society. And, and I think you know, for good reason, not to be comfortable with, with data or data science. And I'm not here to tell you that it's perfect. It's not perfect. It, it's pretty darn good, it gets better all the time. But what I can promise you is if you put faith in it, it will create outcomes for you in terms of your volume and your gross and your turn that you'll look at and say, this is at least rational versus irrational. So be happy to answer any questions. So with the registration for everybody in the room and online, you were given the opportunity to enter any questions beforehand. So we have a few questions here. Uh, we're gonna take some online as well as anyone in the room. I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the first one that came in with the registrations, which is 
Dale, where do you see the used vehicle business heading in 2024? The prediction game. You know, I, I'm not terribly good at predicting the future. You know, I, I my my best view or outlook is that uh, we're going to continue to operate in a uh, uncertain envir economic environment for the first half of the year. I think if things are going to improve on the cost of money side, if things are going to improve on the sort of world stage of events, I, I think we're in this, you know, for at least six more months. Um, I, I, the optimistic side of me wants to believe that the second half of the year has the potential being brighter than the first half. But that said, let me tell you something, in spite of the high cost of money, in spite of all the craziness that's happening in the world, uh, it is not as bad as, as one might have thought it could be given these conditions. So, you know, I, I think we need to count our blessings that, you know, we certainly are not having the year this year that most of us had in 22 and 21, but you also have to remember those are really extraordinary, exceptional years. So I, I you know, I, I think that all things considered, uh, what we're experiencing now and what I think we're likely to experience in the first half of next year ain't all bad. Um, and I think, you know, I think it could get better. Obviously, bad things can happen too, but I'm going to choose to say the second half of next year, I think, shows uh, some some encouraging signs. Okay. Any in the room here? I've got a few online. We've got one online. Okay, read one from a online. A few, actually. Yeah, um, yeah so... A couple of you asking online if we're going to be sending the recording out, we will be, and also the presentation deck as well. I've noticed some people are taking pictures. A um, few questions from Adam in Montreal. Um, question for Dale. Do you think it's okay for an inventory buyer to be a desk manager at the same time, or is it a conflict of interest detrimental to the greater good? Well, it, it, there are obviously going to be some conflicts of interest. I mean, we get our ego involved in buying cars, what we bought, what we paid for it. And, you know, it, it, it is theoretically potentially conflicting with other decisions that we have to make. So, you know, I, I think in an ideal theoretical world, which is not our world, you would like to have it all being done by separate people. Is that practical? No, not practical for most operations. So, I, you know, I, I think that's where it really comes down to the quality of the human being's judgment. It also obviously has something to do with their incentive program being properly balanced. So, uh, you know, in, in the strict sense, uh, you know, I, I think it's inevitable. You're going to have uh, the same person doing multiple jobs with potentially conflicting incentives or, or uh, beliefs. But, you know, I, I, I think that you, you manage that situation by having the right people properly incented. Okay, I'm going to go with another one on the on the sheet here. How do we as dealers stay fair with customers in a market that has used car values that are in some cases above the original MSRP? You know, when I reviewed that question in advance, I, I, my first thought was that was a question that I would have expected 18 months, 24 months ago when we were seeing used car values in excess very often of new car prices, MSRPs. Um, and I do realize that, that Canada does have some different dynamics. It may still persist to a greater extent in Canada today than it does in the US. Um, and, I, and I can't really speak directly to, to how prevalent it is today, but you know, I, I think for, for good or bad, I think the days when we have to justify the price of a used car exceeding the MSRP price of a new car, I think those days are largely behind us. So I don't think that's going to be a huge problem to the extent it's any problem at all much longer. Um, but, you know, it, it, when it comes down to it, it's supply and demand. I mean, it's supply and demand. If, 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 uh, if supply and demand suggests that the value of a late model used car is higher than 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 a new car, it probably means that that new car is not very readily available. So if they want that car today, they have to pay a premium price. So, um, you know, I, I realize it's odd and it might be discomforting, but, uh, you know, markets are markets and supply and demand generally produce rational outcomes. It's, it's, when, it's when we don't 
accept rational recommendations based on supply and demand that we get ourselves into funny situations, I think. I have Glenn asking online, is an individual dealership going to have the ability to affect the factors that determine the designation of platinum, gold, silver, or bronze? You know, I think dealers spend way too much time thinking about managing what percentage of their inventory is platinum, gold, silver, and bronze. I, I think you can affect it to some extent. I don't think you can affect it a lot. I mean, some dealers have a lot going for them. You might have a very hot franchise that gives you lots of trades and you got a lot of good trading power where you can get lots of trades and get them really cheap. Well, if, if that's your blessing, you're going to have a lot more platinum and gold cars than a dealership that doesn't have that blessing. That said, I'm less concerned about what your distribution of platinum, gold, silver, bronze is. I'm much more concerned with whether you treat those categories properly. Properly. So let's get our order of operations, I think, straight. Job number one is to make sure that we're asking for the right money for the cars given their platinum, gold, silver, bronze designation. And then once we get that nailed down, then I think we could have a more nuanced discussion about what we might do to get more cars in the platinum and gold bucket. But I, you know, I think there's only so much you can do there, probably some, but not nearly enough that I would like to say we could affect it in a big time way. That's a good question. Thank you. We got one here in the room, Dale. Please. Hi, Dale. Um, when we're talking about <clears throat> when we're talking about the ROI scores and how that then relates from to pricing backwards to appraisals, should we be shooting for a specific ROI score as a starting point appraisal? Knowing obviously you're going to need to manipulate, but should you start shooting for a silver? Should you shoot for a gold? And will that appraisals will that ROI score? be reflected as we're building our price backwards in the appraisal side of the tool? Okay. And that's a really, really deep question, a good question. There's a lot there. And just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna properly, thoroughly, but let me just make a couple of points. Number one, I think you should appraise cars to get deals. Okay? That said, I think we all would agree on this, that the best way to know how to get in a car is to first know how to get out of the car. Well, today, with the benefit of data science, we have the ability today to know way better than we've ever been able to know in the past what it's going to take to get out of a car. Now, if we have that knowledge, doesn't it make sense to provide a target to the person appraising the vehicle? And I stress a target range. Because I've been around long enough to know that there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of situational stuff going on around determining the value of a vehicle, stuff that a computer will never know. So I think you have to give an appraiser their head. You have to defer to them on what they're going to do in the moment. That said, two things. Number one, I would like to give that person in that moment a target range that aligns with how we're likely going to have to price it to sell it. Give them a target range. Let them do what they want to do outside that range if they feel the situation calls for it. But let's give them a target range. And then the second thing I believe is don't criticize them for what they did on any given appraisal. But what is completely appropriate, in my opinion, is to hold appraisers accountable for what they do over many appraisals. And the example I'll give you is a real life example. With this new appraisal tool that I did not show you, did not talk about today, what you'll see in your dealership is that you have some people appraising cars in the same showroom that are able to get the trade, let's just say 65% of the time within the target recommended range. And you all have another appraiser in the same showroom that can only do it 25% of the time. That's really powerful information to know. 
There's something about that appraiser who can only get the car within the range 25% of the time that suggests that we maybe should make some adjustments, training, coaching, or maybe they shouldn't be appraising the cars. So, you know, it, a lot there in that question, but I say, number one, appraise cars to get deals. Number two, let's give our appraisers upfront in the moment guidance, guidance, not mandates, not edicts to get the car in this range or don't get it. Let's give them guidance with the hope that they can get the car in the range. And then over time, once they've done 25 or 50 or 100, we're going to rank order them and we're really going to see who in our dealership has the ability to get cars for the right money more than others. And again, that gives us the opportunity to know how to make adjustments. Does that make sense? Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Online? Yep. How accurate would it be to price our vehicles using the market percent based on vehicles available in the radius where a lot of them are priced wrong anyway? Well, <laughs> priced wrong anyway in whose opinion? I, the only opinion I care about is what the shopper opinion is. And that car could be priced wrong all day long, but you know whether we like it or not, that reality is our shopper's perception and will likely determine whether we see them or they see them. So listen, you know, I understand that there's some bad actors in the market. I mean, that price cars fraudulently or with a lot of disclaimers or asterisks or that sort of stuff. But largely speaking, you know, those are the those are the exceptions. Largely speaking, you know, dealers price vehicles the way they price them, the way they're willing to transact them. And the only, you know, the only person whose opinion, whether it's wrongly priced or not, is the shopper. And I would like not to come out on the wrong end of that opinion if I can avoid it. Hey, Dale, how are you? Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna just do a, a quick quote here. If there is one metric I could not absolutely live without, market day supply is that metric. I think uh, that's a quote from your first book. Yeah. You still believe that today? It's a two part question. Yeah. Uh, would like mine day supply not override the market day supply metric in, in Viato's case? Yeah, so let me, thank you. Let me take the second part of the question. We publish in the auto market day supply, like mine and overall. Like mine is the one I'd prefer to use. So then you might ask, well, why do you give us overall? Well, sometimes there's not enough vehicles in the like mine competitive set to calculate with statistical reliability an average price or a market day supply. So then we revert to more of a general description of the vehicle just based on your make model, not necessarily trim or equipment. So we give you some idea, but of the two, if you can get a like mine, that I think is, is the better. Now to the first part of your question, market day supply is hugely important. But when I wrote my early books of velocity management, we didn't have the knowledge and the understanding today of what other factors influence return outcomes meaning primarily how right you own the vehicle and its retail volume in the market. So today, what I would say is I have no less belief in the importance of market day supply, but I will now elevate to the same level the knowledge of our cost to market and the retail volume of that vehicle. Put those things together properly weighted, it gives us even better. So market day supply was the best we had years ago. Today, again, with the benefit of data, science, and experience, we now know that there are other factors that properly weighted are, are equally and sometimes even more relevant. Does that answer the question? Great. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Here's one that was submitted previously. Um, I am in Quebec. EV demand is high, yet the rest of the world doesn't seem so popular. <laughs> yet the OEM think they are. Are the OEM out of the ballpark? You know, I, I, I think the OEMs are coming to terms with the fact that they may have jumped the gun on this. Um, 
it's yet to be determined, but I, I, I think if you read, you know, the, the trade press and the trade press is represented here in the room, they could speak to this better than I can. But I think if you read their publications, what we're beginning to see is more and more articles written about the fact that they are uh, downward adjusting their EV production uh, and, and sales estimates and recognizing that maybe there's a bridge between uh, ICE and EV and that being, uh, that being some form of a hybrid. So I, I, yes, I, I think there probably was a little bit too much hype and enthusiasm and optimism. Um, as much as I'd like to believe we could get off of uh, carbon fuel, but um, we'll, we'll find our way. We'll find our way, but it's, it's going to be a rocky road, I think. Okay, great. Thanks. We have one more in the room here. Hi, Dale. Uh, it's Barish. Uh, I, I'm not a dealer. I don't work for a dealership. I work for a trader corporation. Uh, so here's my question. So you talked about the importance of uh, pricing your vehicles, especially for those, the gold and platinum ones, as high as possible. And then you also talked about the attention that you need is from the consumer, from the shopper, right? That's the, the attention that the, you the need. The priority, yeah. Priority. But on the other hand, uh, marketplaces like ours, we have now the capabilities and transparency tools like great price, good price, fair value, above average, and type of um, uh, transparency tools that tell the consumer how the prices, uh, how that vehicle is priced. So putting two and two together, how do you as a dealership, how do you balance that high price and high uh, above point. average price? You, you know what I'm saying, right? right. How so, do you balance that so that you don't lose any you. attention on the car? Now, I, I, I appreciate the question because one of the most common questions I get in this whole variable management profit time context is they say, Dale, how does this make sense? Theoretically, we could have two of the same identical cars and simply based on owning one at a lower cost to market than the other, we'll have one priced much higher and the other one priced much lower. How does that make any sense? Well, let me turn the question back to you. If that was your money invested in those two cars, one you own for 98% of market, the other one you own for 88% of market. Do you care which one moves first? Well, the answer is, of course, you care which one makes moves first. And that's why we're going to price the one you own for 98% a lot cheaper than the other one. That only makes sense. Now, the other side of that question is, well, how does the customer come to terms with that? And I say, OK, I got a good one for you on that. Here's what you say to the customer. Sir, ma'am, this is your lucky day. <laughs> You can buy the exact same car, you know, four thousand dollars cheaper. It's your lucky day. But it, you know, how does it not make sense? How does it not make sense when you, when it's your money, you've made the investment, you take the risk, you suffer the opportunity costs of not putting that money in the bank and earning five percent in a in a government issued bond. I mean, you deserve on that car because it probably was a hard car to find or to acquire as, as a platinum car. You deserve what it's worth. And, and if it's, if it's not worth that to a consumer, you know, that should be okay. But you see that points out the problem in our industry. That's never okay to us. We always think that we have to take any deal we think that we have to make every deal. And I want to tell you, the smart businesses, there are some deals where the best decision is to say, no, thank you. But we have a really hard time doing that in our business. Well, we, you know, we will, we will take the $1,800 deal on the car we own 2G short and, and very often not even recognize we did it. I don't think that's okay. I think it's okay. I think it's okay on some, on some cars under some situations to very respectfully say to a shopper, thank you, but no thank you. This is our price. Can I show you another car? But I, again, I realize that's not the way we're trained to think. And this is why it's hard. But we will make some really significant grosses that we're passing. And what really disturbs me and I can promise you, when you see your inventory through this new investment lens, that's not your problem. 
Your problem is that you're pricing your best cars as if they're distressed cars. That, that's, that's the problem I would ask you to justify to me, not me to justify to you how you potentially under some situations say, no, thank you. I mean, does that sort of make sense to you guys? Another one from, oh, we got one in the room here, Clarice, right there. Uh, two, part, uh, Dale, uh, two part question. Number one, you're just talking about uh, return on investment percentages. So number one, what do you feel is a adequate uh, ROI percentage on your used car department? Uh, number two, will V Auto uh, begin to categorize our cars in those platinum, silver, gold, bronze categories? So we don't publish, we don't publish ROI on the sale of the vehicles. And, and let me tell you, this has been a longstanding running debate inside our company. I mean, if, if this is based on ROI, optimizing ROI, it would be, it's a completely fair question to say, why isn't a report out the ROI? Or what is a proper ROI? And what we found is, and, and we experimented with this in the very early days, we did give dealers the ROI on their vehicle transactions. And it created nothing but but nightmares. <laughs> nothing but nightmares. Uh, people in dealerships were getting criticized for decisions they made based on those ROI outcomes. Uh, people disputed the ROI outcomes, so we just stopped. We just stopped and, and basically have fallen back to the position that basically just says to the industry, if you own a car for a lot of money, and it's got high supply, low demand, and it's a low volume in the mover in the market, can you argue with the fact that you'd be better off selling that car sooner rather than later? And conversely, if you have a car that you own really cheap under the money and it's got low market day supply and, and it's a high volume car, can we just not all agree that that car deserves a little bit more time at a higher price to see if it would deliver it? So that that sort of the happy medium that we landed at. So so intentionally, you know. We've, we've learned the lesson that to start to interject ROI reporting on a vehicle by vehicle basis into a dealership is gonna create a huge distraction and a lot of controversy in the dealership. So when you're selling software commercially, that's not what you wanna do. The second part of your question was, and this is where you know I feel just a little bit uncomfortable. Um, we invested millions and continue to invest millions in the uh, in the data science, and we created new software. I mean, Provision, which many of you use today, was purpose built software that was purpose built to drive velocity thinking and behavior. When we changed the strategy to variable management, we had to build new software that's similarly purpose built to drive thinking and behavior. This software costs more money. Um, and I don't want to be perceived that I'm here to sell you software because I promise you, my life doesn't depend on selling software. My paycheck doesn't depend on selling software. I don't think software is the answer. I, I think the only answer that ever will achieve sustainable performance improvement is, is a good strategy well executed. So um, we, sell, we sell a new version of software. It's called Profit Time GPS. It does some incredible things, I sh as I showed you at the end. But I would strongly recommend that nobody believe that the answer to, to better performance is going out buying the software. I think what you really need to do is you need to understand why the software makes sense. What we talked about here today. And there's probably lots of people back at your dealership who didn't have the benefit of being here today that similarly will not understand. And, and I think that we need to get people in the dealership understanding the shortcomings of what we're doing today why it makes sense to do it differently, how we're gonna do it differently, and then make the decision, pull the trigger and, and possibly buy some new software. If you could accept that answer. Thanks, Dale. There's another one in the room. I get there first. Good morning, thank you. Um, quick question just with regards to like mine day supply. At what point does distance make the value not valuable. Yeah, I, the further you go out, the less relevant it becomes to your market. But, but here's one thing I would tell you, depending on where you are, if you're in a relatively densely populated area, let's say, you know, the Toronto market, if you have a car where you have to go out a long distance, 
to, to get enough data like mine to calculate a market day supply. What does that tell you about your car? It's a rare car and not always, but often rare cars require rare buyers. So if, if in, a, in any side, decent sized market, if you have to go out any sort of significant kilometers to get um, a like my number, to me that the first indication is risk. It's, it's a risk factor. Um, but the, long, the further you go out, the less relevant that, that number is.